man. What's up? What's up? Happy New Year. Welcome to a new episode of All Over VoiceOver with Kip VH. I'm your host, Kip VH, and with me in the studio, the lovely, the talented Mr. Pat Fraley. Pat, I, I just, I'm just grateful that you're here. Well, what a wonderful day to rule the universe. I'm so happy that I'll be out of here in less than an hour. <laughs> Folks, that's my crank. That's your crank. 200 shows. 200 shows? Yeah, yeah. we did 200 shows. I sat for nine years next to Rob Paulson because we were bad in the back <laughs> and naughty. And we liked to uh, ad-lib lines. And, of course, we recorded it in like 1914. It was the first Ninja Turtle. Yeah. But uh, uh, I remember we, would tr- we got bored with ad-libbing. We were amusing each other. Uh-huh. We got bored with ad-libbing, so we'd hand each other ad-libs. We look through a script. Then we did a, a hundred sixty-five episodes of Bobby's World where they wouldn't script us because they knew we'd change everything. Oh, seriously? The writer said, "No, you... why write for them? They're just going to change everything." But anyway, in Ninja Turtles, I remember he pulled. I had a line that said, "How would you like to be boiled in oil?" He handed me this line, and we got away with it. How would you like to be sautéed in oil with just a touch of cilantro? <laughs> and we got away with it. But then after that was union arbitration. No, no, you can't say that. No, no, and then oh. squeak a few through. When when did that sort of take place? It, was it more uh, mm. kind of after a couple seasons and people were no? Getting, or it was just oh, well industry wide, like clamped down on improvisation and that kind of stuff, or just on that particular series. It was it was loose back in the day. Uh huh. If your line was funnier, they take it because the writers weren't in the power structure. I see. Uh, in Ninja Turtles, uh, we didn't know what we had, and we ad libbed. They loved it. We they took everything we had because they said, "Well, that's better. That's better." That's better. Then when it got a, it was huge a hit. Then they clamped down, ironically. Huh. But we still fought for it because Rob and I just can't stay away from it. But imagine nine years next to the same guy once a week. There's not many shows that let you do that even like friends right because you're right there with him for every scene you're and you know we didn't have scenes together he was Raphael, right but we just we just killed each other it's just the the greatest and when you're working with funny people which animation tenly draws comic uh people with comic experience improv all that right. other 85, stuff if you 85 percent of animation is comedy driven 85% of video game is drama driven. That's why you really can't mix the demos. I remember mm. when we did your uh, yeah. video game demo, no comedy. Right. No, it's not about that. And and those guys don't come from theater, so they go, ah, wow, that is not part of the style of our show. Huh. And also playing out of style. If you play a scene like, Bobby, come here, I need to talk to you. And you go, Bobby, come here, I need to talk to you. It won't fly because it's it's either drama uh, it's either movie acting uh-huh. contemporary real bobby came here i want to talk to you or it's melodrama which is reality on steroids bobby come here i need to talk to you where you literally in audio you slam them to a close-up yes uh, of course you can't go too far with that with video game when you're doing the recorded tracks is you don't know what the pictures are. Right, exactly. So you, you can't go that far. But you can in other mediums that are only audio. You can snap to a close-up and go, <clears throat> you can go, yeah. Uh, hey, bye, Barbara. I hear. No, hi. Okay, I'll see you. Look, I'll be, call me when you get home. <laughs> oh, lose my number. Right. You can You can create, well, you know, it's just a metaphor, but we all know about film, close up to medium shot. To, yeah. It's an interesting way of put, putting it. I, I, I love that particular exercise that you, um, and the first time I took a workshop with you, we did that specific thing of working with mic proximity. And, oh, really? And you, yeah, using that technique to create that theater of the mind for whether it's the advertising people who may change it when we're in the session or the audience down the road. Right. And uh, and the value and how you can really create a, a, a th- kind of a three-dimensional space in, in the – as I stick my fingers in my ears – for the audience. Right. Well, uh, look you at – you know, journalism and uh, the, the uh, center of uh, self-direction mm. is text analysis, right? And it's the who, what, where. 
Now, who are you? Yeah. Um, what's the story? And where are you? Well, the where are you is covered a lot of times by uh, microphone technique. It makes mm. a good choice better. It, it, it's it, without a good choice. It's nothing. Right. But I remember when I came to town and I, I arrived in Los Angeles when I was about 30. Okay. I had uh, studied acting in the East, got an MFA. So I, I must have been about, let's see, set 24. OK. Then I emigrated to Australia to do Shakespeare. That's right. That's where I started my career. People go, why? Well, you couldn't get hired in the States. And I went to a agent um, who was Robert Redford's agent and huh. brought him along and saw him. And this is how back in the day it was, Kiff. Um, he looked at my resume and he went, well, you're light on Shakespeare. I don't think you'd be hearing that. <laughs> so I went, OK, fine. Uh, where do they speak English? Yeah. Uh, can't get into England. You need a green card. Mm, Australia, they, they speak English. Sort of. You know. Yeah. And so I went, to, I went through this whole thing. And there were only two American actors in the country that time. No kidding. There was only Mel Gibson and me. And Mel's four years younger than I. He was still in acting school. No I was kidding. the only young American. So I got some, uh, I, I learned how to do voiceover there um, because they called the theater and said, we need a Jimmy Cagney accent. Oh, no worries. We've got a Yankee in the company. Because they figure we sit around bars and go, you do Humphrey Bogart, and then I'm going to do Betty Davis, and then you do my Betty Davis doing Humphrey Bogart. That's what they figure we do. Right. I didn't know how to do them. So I went to the flat, and I was staying with a guy, a writer, and I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to Jimmy Cagney. And he goes, oh, I do. You, you dirty rat. You kill me, brother, you jocko. <laughs> so I'm going, okay, <laughs> slid out the Geordie accent, went out and did my worst. I'm walking out of the studio, and it paid 75 Australian, which was about 120 uh, for the gig. Okay. Now, that was the same price I got weekly to do rap. Hmm. So, you know, next to crack, Shakespeare's really, you know, Sherry, right. your wife will know about, you know, supporting a Shakespeare habit. Yeah, right. It's tough. Yeah. And so I went, well, that's a good, that's good. And they paid you cash in a little packet. Oh, man. And so I'm on the way out, and I was always getting busted in theater for being too big. I grew up around the deaf, and my, uh, my grandfather taught the deaf, and my huh. mom grew up in s state institutions for the deaf, and so we were all like way too big. That's so fascinating. Right, and so I was always huge. If yeah, Fidel Farce, I'm your guy. Uh, Check off. The pilot light went out. <laughs> so anyway, I'm walking out of the studio, <laughs> doing okay, and, and they go, oh, "We like you," and I went, "Really? Why?" And they said, because you're so big, we can't get the actors to be that big. Huh. And four years later, I I think about four years later, I walked into Hanna-Barbera for my first cartoon job. No kidding. You know, I thought, well, that's it. You know, I just wanted to be a performer. I said, if that's what I got, which, which is kind of interesting because part of personal style is flaunting your limitations. True style is flaunting your limitations. It's not just your skills. Um, if you're an angry guy, mm -hmm. you flaunt that. You become, oh, he's an angry guy. Gene Hackman, he didn't do a movie that he didn't yell in until he had a heart attack. <laughs> and what was the basketball movie he did? Hoosiers. Right. First movie after his heart attack. Huh. And, and there's a scene by a fence where Barbara Hershey says something you know, disparaging to him. And I'm going, here it comes. Oh, boy. Right. And he kind of looked at him and went, <laughs> sort of like, I'm going a different way now. Huh. Uh, but yeah, it, it it's part of the the mix. So I grew up loud, mm -hmm. uh, exaggerated, and so I flaunted that, and that became part of my personal style. That's it's so interesting how how animation craves mm -hmm. that scale. Yeah, well, you know, it's all over the place with style right now. Mm -hmm. Everything from prime time me bone reel to wild and woolly. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time when I started, I was on the tail end of the Jetsons, Flintstones, Huckleberry, Hound, you know, those shows. And it was all the same sound. Bobby, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Hey, Bobby Lou. Uh -huh. It all was not only the same volume, and we were using these crappy little sure mics. Huh. They were like $100 mics. Really? Oh, yeah. And we'd be in this big studio, and we'd all be laid out in a row so the engineer could see us. Ah. Uh. It wasn't for us because you could have somebody way on the corner, and you had to listen really carefully to hear their line. But it was all about the same 
volume. And here's something you, you'll find interesting. Put everybody out to sleep or what the heck. <laughs> is right. that, that it, it, on every line, because if you think about it, the rhythm was da 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 they would, <clears throat> they would cut the line of the preceding line to yours. They'd cut in five frames, which is what? One something of a second? One fifth uh, of a second? One, yeah, just about one fifth. Yeah, right around there. Yeah, so you can't, you couldn't go, um, if Garrett went, how do you like my hair? You couldn't go, oh, beat, beat. Oh, it's nice. Right? You couldn't do any of that. You had to do this. How do you like my hair? Well, beat, beat, beat. It's nice. It tricked the editors into keeping the pause in there. Oh, wow. Yeah, we had little tricks. But to, going back to mic technique, I went in there. I didn't know anything about mic. You can stand in front of it, right? Yeah. It, that's right, rather like saying, okay, I'm a movie, and I'm going to film it with a security camera. Right. I mean, no, I shouldn't disparage it that much. I know people that have great careers. They don't do mic technique. Mm. But <clears throat> when I came to town, I was working with Casey Kasem, Vic Perrin, Les Tremaine used to be the guy that would do the cigarette commercials for Lucky Strike in the 30s. Oh, man. On radio. All these old school guys were on the tail end. Gary Owens wasn't uh -huh. tail end, but they were in their 50s, 60s, sometimes some 70s. Okay. And they'd, they'd go in front of the microphone. And right now what I'm doing is like scooping my head around because they go, hi. And they'd slide. This is Casey Kasem. Good to see you. Listen. The other day, I was talking to a guy. They were all over that thing. And I thought of it as a steel lollipop, and they're playing a Stradivarius. Right. So I thought, this is kind of interesting. And I, I always sort of was interested in how they recorded us anyway. I just, not a real, I didn't like that. I liked it, not the technical side, but it was like, like they're, they're voodoo hoodooing me. Yeah. And I kind of like that. So I interesting kind of aspect to... Uh, you know what it is? Knowing about the technical side, knowing how to edit yourself, is rather like Monet, who really had this wonderful surge in his career as an artist when he was an octogenarian. Yeah. And he did all the pawns. I, I just saw a movie. I think it was a mammoth movie. When somebody said, yeah, there was a Monet. What was it up? A lily. They're all the lilies. <laughs> Something like that. But see... What they didn't know, this old guy, because they said, well, how did he get that, that energy and that focus? Well, what they didn't know is before he painted them, he dug them and created them. Are you, what? Yeah. He make his pawns. And so it's the perfect metaphor for craft and art. If you uh -huh. call what we do as art, I don't think it's art. I think it's a, a craft. But nevertheless, it's better for a metaphor to think uh -huh. the art came after he understood it from the inside out. And so the relationship of being able to edit yourself, even if yeah. you don't, knowing what's going on <clears throat> generally, gives builds a confidence. Yes. And where this really was important for, for me is I got, I got – I produced The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn – in audiobook form. Now, I've always had a reading disorder my entire career. Hmm. I found out later I relate to sound, not words. So it was always a challenge. I had to record or uh, rehearse more. My process was tricky so they wouldn't find out. Uh -huh. I'll get to that after okay. I finish it because it's pretty funny um, how I got a career. But anyway, so I'm <laughs> two and a half months in the studio doing Huck Finn. Were you, were you self-recording Huck no, Finn? No, I've was. i always recorded with a director. Okay. Got to have a director. Yeah. Because just, you know, I'd make a choice, you know, in a show. If I, if I had an audio book that was a uh, a mouse and, uh, and the wolf goes, you know, I'm thinking I'd like to eat you. And I do the mouse. Really? Right. <laughs> I put my hand up like, what do you think? Opening uh -huh. it because my engineer was short. I couldn't see her face. She was full, uh -huh. <laughs> full of the monitors <laughs> and she'd either put her thumb up or yep. she'd put her, her hand flat out and wiggle it like, nah, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. And of course, I've never had a note more. So I knew that meant take it down a little bit. Gotcha. But nevertheless, um, <clears throat> I went through this process and. I, st I only did two-hour sessions. Why? Because it's written in d dialect where you have big Jim, Jim going, the other day I was asking, asking this guy to go on down, and it was like 
X and Guan yeah. down. So it was really, it's all written phonetically like that, It was that written like in dialect yeah. on some characters. But besides, I can't read. You know, I can't read a sense without making a mistake. I'm getting better for some reason now. Just huh. before you die, you lose weight, you look good, and apparently you lose a reading disorder. Okay, so <laughs> so it was it was like labor. It was I loved it, but 93 characters. It was throwing bear rabbit in the briar bushes because yeah. that's my deal. And and Mark Twain always in doing Mark Twain remind me of what Carl Malden said about working with Brando. He's a big actor. That uh, first generation Serbian who never made a subtextual choice in his life. Listen, buddy boy, <laughs> I've got nose holes the side of the Mulholland Tunnel. You know, it was all just straight ahead. He was an unattractive. Here's Brando, beautiful. Uh -huh. um, and uh, he was tall. Brando was shorter. So, he, you know, it was a great combo. Yeah. And uh, in fact, Brando once signed a, a, a photo of them together to Carl and said, it's not. Every man that can tell, say, we had the best of each other, right? Wow. Yeah. And oh, anyway, man. Carl Malden would say, oh, gosh, have I, it's going to come bubbling up through the ooze. Well, he said, you can't compete with genius. It's nice to come up to it. And that's the way I felt working with Mark Twain. Yeah. But anyway, here's the thing about craft and, uh, and art. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd feel so bad because... I would stumble and I three to one ratio, four to one ratio. Mm -hmm. My director was patient. My engineer was patient. I apologized to him and he said, are you kidding me? You know what I do for a living? I'm listening to Huck Finn. I don't care how many mistakes you make. Right. If you make four mistakes, I get to hear something of value four times. Oh, that's, so that, that's that great. made me feel better. But yeah. I'd come home and I'd load up the digital tapes. They were those little cassettes at yeah. the time, digitize it. And I would I learned to edit in the evenings after I worked, I didn't even need slate sheets because I remembered all the mistakes. Yeah. By the way, it took me about wow. 10 years before I could listen to it because all you hear is, oh, yeah, I remember that was 10 takes. I remember, you know, that's all I remember is the process. Right. But I would edit it to get, you know, my work together, get the two hours at night, about 11 o'clock I'd finish, and I'd go, you know, this is pretty good. And I, I, it infused me with a confidence. Yeah. Pat, it doesn't matter. You can edit this tonight. Or when I'd work with other people, oh, yeah, well, you wouldn't have a home if I weren't making mistakes. So the engineer's happy. Right. And so that was a, that, that's a great deal about knowing a little bit about it. Let, let me go yeah, into yeah, something, yeah. though, cause you, to amuse you. Yes, please. Amuse me on my show. It's always – I mean, I remember uh, I first met you. I was teaching you. Yes. In Chicago. In Chicago. We, all, we went out to uh, – you and Sherry, your wife. Yes. We, and we went out to uh, an Italian place right down the block. Right. And what struck me, because, you know, I'm older, I have a reputation. Mostly students are kind of a little bit, hello, Mr. Fraley. Uh -huh. And here we are sitting at a table, and I'm known for character voice work. Uh -huh. And you're doing impression after impression and doing little routines as a character that you'd worked out, probably did on stage. I don't know. Yeah. And I got the, I, I was hit with, Boy, this guy is so good at public relations, which is establishing a relationship. It's not mm. promotion. You weren't showing, oh, look what I can do. You were going, I'm going to amuse you. Yeah. It was all about amusing. Absolutely. A and that's where you can get away with that stuff because no one goes, oh, he's trying to sell his stuff. You were going, you know, I, I can't remember. If, if you buy, you know, I... I impressions or something, that was one of the, th one of the things that I loved about... I was just saying to my father while I was driving over here, telling him that we were going to sit down together. And uh, I was like, oh, I, I get to talk to Pat today. And I'm excited about it because Pat's one of those guys who when you told me that you did Buzz Lightyear uh, uh, and voice matched Tim Allen. and Nine that years. Whole for nine years. And worked on the movie, too. You worked on the film? Yeah. You see, I, well, he couldn't do exertion sounds. He'd get hit with something. He'd go, ooh. And he also would swear. Oh, oh, well, yeah, you yeah. Can't, it, you can't. Am do I that. stepping in the wrong place? No, here? that's okay. I'll come, okay, but I, that, it's it's totally fine. <laughs> so I'm in a, a John Lasseter, head of Pixar, would call me in to clean his tracks for a movie, because he'd go, he'd go, um, Zerg, I hate you. You're up in a blank. Beep. 
And, uh, uh-oh, I think I'm in this spacesuit. You know, he, he'd do stuff like that. Yeah. And so he'd call me in to clean his tracks for movies and toys and stuff like that. And he called me Buzz Light. <laughs> But anyway, That's you hilarious. were saying you, you were enjoying. Well, I mean, what uh, it's always been something that I did, and I didn't know anybody else who did it. Impressions? Yes. Really? Yeah. Even in Chicago? Uh, even to an ex- even in Chicago. Why didn't they? I honestly, I don't know. Maybe because it's the realm of stand uh, stand up comedy. Well, even at Second City, it was a thing where like I would. It was sort of looked down on, like it's, it's very much so. It's lowbrow, exactly, yeah, exactly. And you came into the world of, or that Deb Dotzer introduced me to you and said, "Fraley's come and take his class." And I think the world of Deb. Uh, I and... teach with her every time I go to Chicago oh. now for three years. She's my guest. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, she's amazing. Right. And uh, but she was like, "See Fraley," and when you started talking about voice matching and your experience. My, my background is uh, multimedia production, so I came at it as a producer. Really? Yeah. So the so editing, putting shows together, putting uh, my my first re- I've the only I think you are the only person I paid to make a reel with. And you know anyway. what? <laughs> I got about three hundred bucks <laughs> because uh, it was the because video I cut game so demo. Much stuff that was right. And I'd say, okay, well, you should probably do that quieter. All of a sudden, boom. Like, like this? In 15 minutes, I get your, and you had a pretty good studio at home. Yeah. You got the track. And then I'd go, you, you, we need you to, uh, what was one of the things? Oh, you're on horseback. I want you to, you know, and you got to come up with a sound effect. What do I get? I get you, I'll see you later. I'm going to see my father or something. Right. And I hear the range jingling, the horse railing, <laughs> and gravel. You, tr- you gravel and you riding off. So I got no money out of it. I'm sorry. You, you did everything. But like that, the experience of hearing someone working professionally with those skills and the first, one of my first jobs on the one year anniversary of being in Los Angeles, I booked Stallone's exertions for a film <laughs> Bullet to the Head and have since voice matched Tom Hanks over 20 times last year. Oh, so okay. like, I got a story on voice matching. I got to tell oh, you. Oh, yeah, too. yeah. Tell me. Okay. So I auditioned for this role, a, a, a narrator who's not available for a film okay. at Disney. Pete's Dragon. Okay. So I get the job. I get a pass VIP to park right in front of ADR2. I've oh. never had that. I go in. The director's there. The the editor, uh, Tom, um, Doc Kane, who is the uh-huh. premier uh, engineer over there, and the casting person. So I get in front of the microphone, and I do his narration. He's in the movie, and he turns, and he goes in a narration passage. Okay. After Tom Kane uh, – sorry, not Tom Kane. He's an actor. Doc Kane says, that's the closest I've ever heard a match. Wow. And the director's going, oh, awesome. So I'm driving off uh, Disney going, yeah, you nailed that. Then I'm thinking, you sound just like Robert Redford. He's 80. (laughs) Always a downside. (laughs) Always a downside. But, you know, I grew up in the Northwest, and he's from Utah. Uh So I understand the dialect. Yeah. He's got a little harder uh, uh, R. He's also very thoughtful. Because he was a pretty boy, and so he grew up wanting to let people know he's smart, too. That's why he wears those huh. little glasses. Yeah. And so and he's really quiet. And that's what I did. Well, I went back, and they said to do another session. He eventually did his own narration. Sure. But they tr- do this voice. For scratch, right? Yeah, for scratch. It's, it's a good market in L.A. Yeah. And I heard, he said, a doc, doc said, let me play you what you did. It was the best narration I've ever done in my life. And to this day, I, I, do, I don't do anything but my impression of Rob Redford when I get an audition for a narration. I've never been that quiet and uh, engaging. Isn't that funny? It is. Yeah. It's fascinating how, how a job will teach you that thing. Yeah. And, you, and um, I, I love it. I, I'd love to. Let me, let me tell you. But, yes. Uh, you know, I'm on fire with you on these things, but this is very funny. So I have a reading disorder. Uh, I go to Cornell. Um, my dad bought me a, a tape recorder in 1961 when I was 12. Okay. I would use it, and, and when I had an audition through high school and into college, I would play back and memorize, kind of memorize the lines, and then yeah. come in and pretend like I was reading. Got to the point at... At Cornell, where they were going to kick me out, I was in the MFA program. I wasn't advancing. Mm-hmm. I auditioned for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Yeah. So I'm stumbling with the lines, and I something inside me just released 
it's not going to work. Have a little fun. Huh. And so I had a line as Gildenstern about how can you be in two places at one time? So I say something like, how can you be in two places at one time? <laughs> and I do the theme of Twilight Zone. Yeah. And the, the director, hired, got, I got cast because of that freedom. Mm. When it was just sort of a release from I'm failing, you know, it's always one of my favorite lines is about doing a choice that's out there is, why not? They're already not hiring you. Yeah. So, uh, so, so anyway, I, I make it to Los Angeles. I get a career. I work yeah. around it. And what happens when you have a reading disorder is you know something's going to go wrong. You'll see three W words in a row and you say, okay, you're in trouble hmm. coming up. So I learned to do this. I'd start going along. And if I made a mistake, I'd go, wait, I've got an idea. Let me do that again. Right. And, of course, when I come back and start the sentence again, that infusion of fear and and responsibility would make it an interesting choice. Huh. Then also, I'd get in the middle and say I lose my diction, and I'd go, you know, the other day I was talking to my mother. Oh, no. I got Henry Fonda disease. I got no conscience. I'm left with a vowel and a thumb. <laughs> and I'd make him laugh. <laughs> and... Um, I can't. I had another trick, but I can't remember what it was. But what happened was they didn't care. Of course, right. I'm the only one that's like freaking out. Right. I got a reputation. Oh, the other thing is, I would say a sentence and I would twist around the words to make it work. Hmm. And it, and sometimes they take it. Sometimes they say do it again. Yeah. But it was sort of to make it logical in my 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 pumpkin head. So what happened was I got a reputation of being loose and confident wow. because nothing smells like confidence more than humor and self depreciating humor. Yeah. And especially when you're working. Yeah. And you don't care that you make a joke in the middle. Who cares how much time is that gonna take? Right. The other one is that you're inspired and you're real inspiration. You go, let me do that again. I got an idea. Huh. Right? Yeah. And the other one was that I was loose with the copy. I made it work for me. So I got a reputation for all those things when they were all a cover for a reading disorder. So about 10 or 50, so I rode that pony. Yeah. I'd start doing that because it was part of my process. So about right. 10, 15 years into my career, I stumbled on a sentence in front of Leo Burnett or something. I went, look, I've had a reading disorder all my life. What are you going to do? Fire me? And they're laughing like, no. Okay. <laughs> and I, I let it go. But interesting journey, true styles flaunting your limitations. In a way, I was – see, because only, there's only three things we can, you can do, two things with a limitation, mm -hmm. like being bald. You can hide it or you can flaunt it. Yeah. Either Bruce, Bruce Willis or you're William Shatner. Right. Where you've worn pieces all your career. Good ones, too. Great pieces. He's got the best pieces. That was business. a news flash to me that he was wearing pieces. Right. Me, too. Me, too. But, man – they're, they're sweet. I, I, I did a award ceremony with him where he was being honored, and I was the MC, and I was way too close looking at that toupee. I was looking for the lace. I was looking all over. He'd look at me. I'd go, I'm a big fan. <laughs> yes, uh, apparently. <laughs> oh, man. What a trip. You yeah. mentioned to me, and I did not know this, or you had mentioned this to me before, that you were a creative director. Well, in Outside my, of this experience? Right. Well, I, don't, I, don't well I came back from Australia. Okay. Thinking, I'm going to go to New York. <clears throat> I went to my hometown of Seattle. I'm, wa I'm going to agency to agency to look for what we used to call corporate or industrial work on sure. camera. You bet. I'm wearing an old uh, like Canadian sweater, and like this is like mid-70s. I had bell bottoms on. Right. Platforms. <laughs> and I had like an old tuxedo shirt that hadn't been uh, ironed. Now, got to cut back to Australia. While I was in Australia for a couple of years, they have no incentive to work. It's like you make 10,000. They they tax you 50 percent. Wow. So they, they it's like Canada. They, they just take that capitalistic, you know, aggression out. Yeah. So these guys would call me into McCann Eric and say, hey, you wrote this is a campaign for, you know, uh, uh, this client, we need to get the bottles back so we can refill them. We're on an island, mate. So we have to, it was a, it was a soda pop, right? Yeah. And I went, really? And he goes, yeah, yeah, take it away. You know, you do it. Coca-Cola. So I have this, and I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'll get hired. So I, they had to get the bottles back to refill them. And in the summers, they wouldn't pay. So I'll, some of the campaign was, was, I wrote, is like what they're using those bottles for. And so they'd, I'd have uh -huh. one as a vase going, look at me. 
I'm a vase. I'm a Coca-Cola bottle. Take me home. <laughs> I can't take it. You know, stuff like that, just right. to get work as an actor. But I yeah. wrote all these campaigns, had it on my resume. I'm in with this guy, a creative or the general manager of a agency, and he goes, "Do you wear a suit?" I went, "Yeah, I, I do costume work, no, whatever." You, and he said, no, <laughs> he said, "No, we're looking for a creative director." Oh man, I know. So I got the job because they were looking at Coca Cola, and I'd gone to Cornell. So the bean counter above him that says "Okay" sees Cornell, yeah, and he sees Coca Cola. That's that's how it happens. You know, it's the guy above that recognizes something. Right. So while I was there, we had a lot of food accounts. I used to go to bed and cry because I'd sold out. It was the only day job I ever had, really. Well, really? college jobs. Sure. But, it was, and, but I saved money. And by the time I finished there, I had, a, I had more contacts in L.A. than New York, so I came down. Okay. Now, the thing about it is I learned all about the other side. In other words, like Lord Chesterfield said, I have seen the dirty ropes and oily pulleys that run the gaudy show. And I got to see that. Yeah. So I understood that I might not be cast because, uh, because the director is a, is a large and I'm an extra large and he wants all the sweaters for the, for the extras. I mean, it really got down to that. Man. I remember once I was in a... Um, we'd cast this uh, radio commercial... And we had a kid, it was like a 30s, you know, scene where, um, extra, read all about it, paper, right. mister. And he went, uh, yeah, can you recast that kid? I went, why? Well, he sounds like a redhead. My wife hates redheads. Oh, man. And, of course, my answer was, sure. Of course. Because I'm spending your money. But I went, really, dude? Yeah. You know, so you get, you get all sorts of lessons on the other side. So I save enough money. This is back in the late 70s. Um... And I, my girlfriend and I go on vacation in Tahiti. I meet a producer at Hunter Barbera there. No kidding. Really. And so I'm going, hi, ho, good morning, Mr. Sunshine. And he says, look, if you'll stop doing that, I'll listen to your demo when I get back to Los <laughs> Angeles. So I say, fine. So he does. He says, you know, if you were here, I'd hire you. And I go to my girlfriend and said, well, I've made it. Yeah. I, if I were there, they'd audition me. I've made it. You know, duh. <laughs> So right. we get married. We move to to Los Angeles. He starts hiring me as a guest v villain on the Scooby Doo episodes because he felt so guilty. This young man gets married and moves down, <laughs> and he was so guilt ridden that he kept me alive until it, my career started going. But uh, but what happened with and, and it's something that it's a device to a player if you can. Put up with it and don't mind going to bed crying because you're only doing your day job. Oh, I freelance, but you know what I mean. Right. Is that I saved enough, and what we call in the uh, West a grub steak. It comes from gold. Okay. And the gold miners to get food, a steak, a food steak, grub steak. Okay. So I had my grub steak. So I'd go into these sessions just as a guest, you know, mercy castings. Yeah. And I got to know these older guys, Bob Ridgely, Danny Dark, Chuck McCann, all these guys were about 50 and I was 30. Mm -hmm. And they go, hey, Fraley, you want to go to uh, have lunch? I go, yeah, why not? Right. And see, because I didn't have a day job. I was like a professional actor who always has time on their hands. They're always right. having lunch and telling stories. No, I got a gig and they're in there for 15 minutes and they're back out. It, right. That's the way it is. Right. And so they assumed I was a working professional. And they liked my chops. I had my chops because I got to town at 30. I'd been around a little. I'd yeah. learned voiceover. And, I, and so I started getting jobs as they'd refer me. And that's how it went. And so, hmm, kind of good idea. If you can save some money, put it aside, then come down and focus on yeah. taking workshops, meeting people, hanging out, doing that public relations work that is so valuable. That's right. I've found it to be in, as much as I... Uh, the phrase is from the movie Quiz Show. Rob Morrow says to Mira Savino, I feel like a racehorse whose gate won't open. And I felt that way wow. for 20 years. And even while I was doing stuff at Second City and loving the work I was right. doing, I still felt like I want to be out here doing this work right. and I don't know what it's going to – I know what the path is, but I just – and and would do those jobs, make my grub steak and – all those things, it's the beauty of all of it, how all those things now serve me so much better 
because I was a multimedia producer, right. because I have editing yeah, experience. Yeah, all that stuff you bring to the party That's that you right. think do- doesn't relate. You know, it, you, all you this bring junk, some junk, really, from right. my trunk that I had? Really? Yeah. yeah. It, what, you, what we were talking about reminded me of something. There's only three things in business there's skills, doors, and champions. Mm-hmm. Now, you, if you have the skill set, you got that, but it won't get you anywhere. Right. I mean, you, you can just sit there being really good in your in your living room. Doors. Doors will open for you. They will. But, you know, not enough or you can get more when you get a champion. Now, a champion recognizes you have skills like Don Jurich, this guy in Tahiti, mm-hmm. said this guy's skilled. Um, they ho- help open the doors. Now, you got to be ready because the person... They opened the door for, and this Don George got me, uh, Herb Tannen, the best agent in town in one day. Wow. They have to get back to Don George, the champion, and say, you know, that guy's good. Thank you. So the skills have to be there. Right. But, but, but you need all three of those things. And you always should be looking for a champion, a teacher, a producer, somebody that takes an takes a, a interest in you. Mm. And uh, one thing about that is about being green. Don't don't hesitate telling people green to most when you get somebody that you start to think maybe they could be a champion because they what are they going to make off you money? No, they're going to bring you along. And uh, when I was a young man, I've had about two or three champions, what I call mentors, yeah. maybe three mentors. And I thought, why are they taking I mean, I know, why are they taking, what are they getting out of this? They're giving me so much. Well, now that I'm like old, uh-huh. and hold on, wait, let me check my heart. <laughs> I can still hear it from here. I'm yeah. okay. You're all right. <laughs> I understand, because when I bring along somebody or take an interest in somebody and mentor them, it is so satisfying to me, because, you know, I'll never be a, you know, Nancy Cartwright I've taught. I'll never be a talented 40 year old uh, i'll never be an african-american woman that's 50 mm-hmm. you know and so it's another way i can live through mm-hmm. somebody else just like character work appealed to me because i wanted to be anything but pat fraley yeah this way i get to watch like brad garrett right who says i mentor him i didn't i was like a fifth grader telling the other fifth grader in class go ahead do it do it Go ahead and say that. I just egged him on to do what he did in stand-up when he got into cartoon work, and that's all it was. But when I hear, when I see him work, and uh, and we're we're dear friends, and I teach with him, and once in a while I'll feed him a joke, I'll write a joke for him because I know it's his style. It's so cool to hear or in Nancy Cartwright to to see your work in there. Yeah. Because you're hiding, but there is a real satisfaction to that. I agree. I, uh, there's something incredibly fulfilling in that experience of of just it's it, in a in a very subtle way. I experienced it at Second City directing uh, the grad review shows, oh. where there'll be a student pitches a scene, and the scene is good, but it's just missing a bit, and then. Coming up with that bit in the closet where I'm typing and throwing it in the script and then watching right, it kill right. and sitting back and just watching. Well, you know, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Now, you do on camera. We yep. call it facials. I do facials. Or face, a- I face do acting. Face acting, yes. Uh, and also voiceover work in all sorts of myriads of the genres. Yeah. Um, there is an aspect of voiceover that's kind of cool where... Nobody knows who you are mm-hmm. except your community, and you can be a superstar. Sure. Or you can say, yes, well, and when they go, oh, you do voices, what do you do? Well, I do Dinky the Duck. Cool. <laughs> I grew up with Dinky. You know, <laughs> one thing you can't do is get a table by win- window. You don't go to a restaurant and go, well, I do uh, the voice of Dinky the Duck. <laughs> oh, Mr. Duck, right this way, double by the window. Mr. Duck's in the house. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Right. But what I'm getting to is the idea that um, do you like that kind of disappearance, that ability, or do you, um, or you kind of like getting recognized? What is it? Do, uh, do you I, like getting recognized when you've done something? Ever since the the most the initial splash of recognition I've gotten, and it hasn't really stopped, uh, was from those Denny's commercials I did. Right. 
and they ran all over, in particular Los Angeles, they ran constantly, and it was just my face. Right. My face and pancakes. And you were just playing an idiot. I was playing an idiot. I was just doing yeah, my remind best. Remind me of it. You were like... What's the deal? All these people rushing to work, drinking their mocha chinos, cup of chinos, chocolate chinos, whatever chinos. I don't know this Mr. Chino guy thinks he is, but he doesn't know a thing about breakfast. It's almost like uh, uh, Patrick Warburton, yeah, in a way. a little bit. Kind of a, a butt. I had dipped into... I had tried to do... Uh, originally, the original spec was like a Dennis Leary. So I had I had learned the script so that I could do bits. I memorized it, and then one of the things that separated me from everybody else on that thing was that I looked right down the barrel of the camera. Kinka Usher, our director, was like, "I don't want." And I remember doing the callback at at uh, O'Connor Casting in Chicago. There were four of us called back, and uh, I was number two on the list. And I got there, and the guy who was number one came out of the room with a script buried in it. So it, he had clearly been Uh-oh. like. Okay, that's great. We like your read. We need you to be off camera or off book directly down the barrel of the lens. And I I knew that script backwards to the point that I can still recite it really? five years later. Oh, yeah. So, like, that was a big deal. And that was great. Right, because you know what? They're, they're, it's not them. It's the clients. Right. I mean, they can go, look, he's going to be great. He'll get the line and he's the guy down the barrel. No, But there's somebody else going, well, you know, he doesn't seem to be focusing on us. And they don't get that. And even though they're going to be cutting away. It's still one continuous push, just a slow move. Really? I, like, I want to be able to give them every option. I want to be able to give them every cut point they want. If they want to cut at 10 or if they want to cut at 8, I need to make sure that it's not necessarily driven by copy. Right. It's, it's driven by performance and given, given them their their dream edit. Right. So, um, so but, which, and just a small yeah. energy, that's why I say auditions need to be better than when you do the job. Yeah. Here's why. Producers are thirsty men in the desert. They're only going to drink a glass of water, but they want to get it out of a lake. Mm-hmm. So they see, oh, this, all this potential. It's like a security. It's like an insurance policy, too. So you get, and, you know, uh, so many times I, I've, I've improv and lived on a script Right? Yep. They never use it. But they like the idea that it's there. They want to know that you can. Right. That you're a thinking guy. You get their joke. Do you do multiple takes on certain audition things because of that? Or or will you avoid that? Like always, like if you're doing an audition for- Kiff, I'm Irish. Okay. I go, I, I- I do the I, I I plan I have a strategy I say you know what's the dumb actor need me need to do I okay. want to do or what are the ten guys that are better than I before me ten a hundred how yeah. are they going to do it versus how am I going to do it because I don't want to fall into thinking I'll be the best because you offer anybody three or four options and they go for good and different not best. Mm-hmm. I learned that when I was in advertising. We'd play these auditions for uh, that we had, or or then they go, "Well, that's different," and I go, well, what, "No, we're looking for the best." Oh, okay, but I kind of like that one because mm-hmm. they—that's the way n- human nature is. Yeah. So no, what I do is, and but I've been around a long time. I don't need a booth director because right. I understand about getting attention in the first four seconds. Sometimes on your slate, if there's nothing in the commercial, uh, Andy Minder. Uh, it was, Mark McIntyre, the uh, booth director at CESD, swears uh-huh. up and down that Andy used to get cast on his slates. And I go, well, what'd he do? Yeah. And he goes, it was always different. And I think what he did is he came to the table on how he felt before he w- worked. He insisted on the listener, even if it's t- a Tina with half a tuna sandwich, uh-huh. calling out the bad ones. He'd do things like, ah, Andy Minder playing, uh, doing the voiceover. And he wouldn't ad lib, but Andy Minder, but he would, he, where our, our tendency is to go, Patrick Fraley, voiceover, like dead. Yeah, right. And you're gone. Yeah. Right. But you, but saying I'm a human being is a good uh, thing, but there's all sorts of tricks. Mm. You got a piece of paper? I want to show you my favorite trick on uh, auditioning. I, I do. I okay. Okay, so say you're uh, auditioning for a role, and it's the perfect 75 second audition or a piece, and they want it in 60 seconds. You know, right, it's right. horrible. Yeah. And so you edit. These are old checks. That's good. That'll work. Okay. Just paper noise. There you go. So say you have to. You know, so I edit the whole thing, bef- you know, before I slate it, and it's I get it perfect, and then here's the slate. Okay, Pat Fraley has. 
Commander Zorg. <laughs> and then I, right? And, and then you nail it. And they go, whoa, that guy, what a reader. Just looked at it. Yeah. It's just, uh, <laughs> you know, because there's truth in tricks. This yeah. is like leisure demand to, to uh, auditioning into uh, theater. So nobody goes back to the mu- magician about. <laughs> You lied to me. There's no rabbit in that hat. You lied to me. No, no. If and when they find here's another one I love. I have uh, little recordings I get from people I've worked around the country, like uh, um, Jamie Hunsdale, uh, engineer up at Ban Animals in Seattle. Okay. John Marshall Media, Iris Mackerel. I have all these people, right? And all they say through the slate that that funky sound of through a slate recording yeah the, uh, and rolling on one pat dunk, and rolling on one pat right so i'm in a you know a hotel in boise uh-huh. and i have an audition with my usb mic right, right? i put my robe over my head uh-huh. do the audition but i put that on top so they think i'm like right and i've been busted on it like, hey, I heard you, you working with Jamie from Bad Animal on their audition. I went, no. And I tell them, and they're always delighted. They always, so they never go, they go, really? Oh, God. You know, they're always delighted. But I, inter- but I interrupted you about getting attention. Uh, you still get, I get attention. Do you from like that? it? I do. Yeah. I do, and I have to come to grips with, I, because I'm raised as a young covenant youth in the Christian Reformed tradition of right. being, don't be so pride. I remember my first confession, I'll share, my first confession when I converted to Catholicism was I, I confessed my pride, and I f- was concerned wow. about about just, and I come from a long line of preachers. Right. Oh, really? Guys who are get in front of a congregation and talk and instruct. Wow. So th- that's very much in my DNA. And when I yeah. expressed interest in doing this work rather than the work of the cloth, my right. family was like, but you're preordained to do the work. Right, right, the right. And I was like, yeah, I, I like Eddie Murphy too much. And, yeah. Um, Did you see Mr. Church, by the way? No, I had the screener. I still you have gotta the screener. You got to see that movie. Okay. It's a it's a wonderful performance, but, but you'll weep. That's so great. Oh. Ilsa, if you don't I'll, want... She, I'll prep myself Is she used it. to it? Ilsa? She's, yeah, she... Are you crying? Yeah, she is. Okay, well, We then, go sorry. see... I mean, every Disney movie, I'm a wreck. Oh, yeah, me too. I would, look, at. I went to see one movie, and Renee said to me, this is the first 20 minutes, I'm gone. She goes, are you going to blubber through this whole movie? <laughs> I mean, now at my age, I sneeze. It makes me cry, you know. But anyway, so so you like it, but I do like there's. But you used to think of it as prideful when you were a young man. I did, or I was concerned that it might be just because I right. grew up in a. I mean, right. I didn't grow up around it. It's not part of my worldview or culture, and and in particular in that culture, it's very much like don't make a big deal. And I was bullied pretty That's kind heavily. Of Calvinistic a, too. It's very Calvinistic. Yeah, I went to Calvin College. So oh, there you go. But I, I mean, I was also bullied from kindergarten to tenth grade. Seriously? Oh yeah. My brother bullied me. He's oh, four man. years older. Yeah. My job was to get up and go hide, go find, go out in the forest. We lived in an island. We uh-huh. had boats and water. I'd go out in the forest and play alone, which helped me immeasurably yeah. as far as my uh, imagination and pretending. And what's it all about, Alfie? Yeah. So, so, but you got over that. You see, uh, I was. I never I had a had fight it. that ended it. I had a fight my so, my freshman year of co- of high school with a with a with person? a bully, and I I I I I'll end it this way. I was picking his scalp out from underneath my fingernails. Oh, really? So I cleaned his clock. Really? And and it ended all of it. Everything my dad said of solving problems like that, of like just punch the guy in the nose and it's over. He, he would I, give you that advice. Oh yeah. Throughout, oh. my mother was like, "No, you can't do that. Of course not. Why oh. would you ever?" And, uh, you know, we did the phone calls and the just and and not just one guy, like like probably 12 pricks I grew up around who who made my life really miserable. And uh, but it was the exact same result as I looked 12 for, prickly guys, prickly Il- guys, very Ilsa's prickly listening. That's right. I, pr- I, I think she's heard me use that expression. Prickly. OK. Yes. Very prickly guys. Um, but uh, yeah, I ended up. Going through that, how, discovering how voices and all that other stuff, and it's uh, it, it's weird how it's still there. Wow! And this when I when I tap into anger, that's a that's that's the fire that's burn, that's the pilot light for that fire. No kid, see, I grew up uh, at four years old. I was teaching and and performing, and I never had a moment where I thought I'll be a fireman. 
I was always going to be a performer, yeah. partially because our family would get together. They were Mormon. I grew up Mormon. Oh. And they're always like, God, super, let's have a potluck and a dance. Uh-huh. They were always doing plays and stuff like that. But my mom would say, Patrick, go downstairs and put the tea cozy on your head and do your Chinaman. I was constant. I was like the... The, I was the guy in the family. Yeah. And at four years old, I was the guy playing cowboys and Indians in war. Which they were always Nazis. Yes. It was always what, Nazi guys. I was the guy that could die like you couldn't believe. <laughs> and I'd fall out of a tree, roll, arch my back, froth at the mouth, going, I see him not snicking back. And, oh. They loved to kill me because I didn't go, just crease me. <laughs> right. You I missed. never, I ne- yeah, you miss. I never. Because yeah. I was looking for the opportunity to die. Right. And they would, how do you do that? And I go, well, here's what you do. Here's a couple of techniques. First of all, spit. Let's see it. <laughs> now, arch your back. That means make it curved up. Oh, cool. <laughs> so it was always that way. And I taught through high school. Oh, wow. I, I taught in college. I, I would teach the what freshmen. What you teaching? you teaching acting? Freshmen. Like I would that? be a senior. I was teaching the freshman actors. Okay. Uh, tapped on that. And so it was always part of the game. When I went to Australia in the first two weeks I was there, the local university in Adelaide, Flinders University, called uh, the theater and said, oh, we need someone to teach us vocal dynamics. My worst subject. Huh. That's what they called speech then. Uh-huh. And they oh, we got a Yankee in a company and went to some bloody school. It was like, you know, Yale or something. So I started teaching, right? Yeah. Always been part of the mix. And it's why, it's how I've gotten better. Because I, I remember even paying one of my students 50 bucks for a voice he did. No kidding. I went, oh, i got to have that. And it was kind of this kind of distant... Actually, it sounds a little bit like Mark Hamill. Uh-huh. If you know Mark, he ta- it's perfect impression of Mark Hamill. <laughs> but it was, con- I don't know what it was. I can't remember it now, but I loved it. But, I've, but also, it, it's a touch on the shoulder saying, are you doing what you're teaching? Hmm. You know, accountability. So yeah. it's been a great uh, mix. I, I, I started teaching, I've been teaching improv for a very long time. Were you teaching in Chicago? I taught, yeah. I taught and directed the touring company in Chicago. And really? And taught improv, all levels. Taught. My favorite show that we did there was actually, uh, it was made up of, it was the one show that we did that mirrored the main stage process where we had actors, uh, no, it didn't mirror the main stage process. We had actors improvising uh, creating scenes, and then a group of writers watch this, the improvisations and then go, what did you like? So it made all the writers like a director. And we did, I'd been messing around with uh, reading about uh, Lecoq work, and uh, I got really inspired by, by neutral masks. Oh! And we did, I had them all improvise, um, we did an hour improvisation strictly to music, with with neutral mask work and they created a bunch of scenes <laughs> yeah the show was great okay because it doesn't ring on the concept oh boy oh boy but but you got to do stuff like that. stuff like that but yeah, i've been yeah. teaching i started well when i started at second city in detroit i was an understudy of the touring company and uh, the advantage for that was free classes so I was like, all right, free wow. classes and then level three came around and the producer said uh that class is full um I don't have room for you. Will you teach? And then I was like, oh, okay. They handed me the syllabus, and I've been teaching for the past about 20 years now doing that. Well, it's a great – it's the perfect day job. It is. Because uh, of how it feeds you, and it also feeds my – it's always fed my career at a certain point, too, because uh, I have a reputation and – so I'll teach, you know, somebody, Jennifer Hale or somebody, and oh, she'll man. go, oh, you ought to get Pat Fraley. He's good. Yeah. So it's been a helpful area that way, too. Keep me away from promoting. but in, and, and I do, what I do is I love to do uh, funny short videos or, or oh, audio man. pieces. I love I, that you do that. I, I just love it because, you see, it's a way of sneaking in your promotional yeah. your abilities, but it's, it's way off the nose. Right. And I'll have to send you this one where... Brad Garrett and I were talking about bad concepts of, uh, we were, we, I think we were uh, presenting at the Annie Awards. Oh, yeah. And we were ad-libbing. He said, no, he said, I'll do it with you. No script, no no practice, no cue cards, no no prompter. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> we went on stage, and as we're getting on stage, Billy Crystal's backstage saying, good luck. And I'm going, really? 
<laughs> and I was uh, near terrified, but I got through. And at one point we were talking about, didn't we do um, uh, the Titanic kids together, the animated show, fun under the waves, fun and, right, frolic? And we had, yeah, Barnyard, uh, we did the, bar uh, I can't think of the, uh, Barnyard Fellas, which was all animals like good fellas. <laughs> so I made this uh audio of him talking to Marty, Marty Scorsese about, he goes, all right, you, you, come on over here. What's your name? Craig? Brad. You're Armenian? Jewish. You're a big, tall Jew. Big, tall, drink a Jew. All right. He goes, Harvey's the chicken. Joey's the funny. Uh, Joey's the farmer. You think I'm funny? Yeah, you're funny, Joey. <laughs> and uh, and Bobby is the duck, uh, the horse. And uh, what you do is you take your gun. Like like this? No, you got wings. You can't hold it that way. You got wings. Hold it this way. You point it at him. You, you dirty, rotten nag. I shoot you 24 <laughs> times in the head. Go ahead. <laughs> you dirty, rotten No, no. Do you dirty, rotten nag. You, you dirty, rotten nag. I'll shoot you 24 times in the head. Um, take, take the script away and we'll talk to you. We'll call, call you a little later. Do you think I'm funny? Yes, Joey, you're funny. <laughs> it was one of those things. Yeah. But, you know... Uh, I sent it to my agent, Pat Brady, at CESD, who came from stand-up, so she's up yeah. for a laugh, yeah. to Brad to amuse him. And she said, I'm sending this to the head of Nickelodeon casting because they have a show called Barnyard. Oh, man. Barnyard something. Yeah. And so, you know, I didn't mean it that way. But you you get you throw stuff out like that, if you like tweeting. Right. I have a friend that helps me with tweet, but it's always something amusing yeah. or something of value. Never tweet about my work. And, and, and I got to right. tell you this because I'm working on business of voiceover. I got to get your comments after we finish yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah. We're coming up on it. Yeah. Um, but here's what Joan Baker does we do an event, we teach two days in a row. Just last weekend, we're working there. Maybe one group picture being, you know, high. But you know what she does? When we go out afterwards, we have a little dinner, right? Uh -huh. That's where the picture comes. Mm. Well, we're having fun at dinner. And so it's not like, look at me work. It's look at us visit. Yeah. And so it's off the nose. And it's that's more like. Great. Right. That's really great. And it gets and a great a string of comments because, oh, that looks wonderful. And, and it's not like, you know, you missed the event. Right. And as a performer. It's the same deal. You know, it's something like afterwards, it's it, off the nose. Or like I told you, you get a promo buddy. Yeah. And they bang the drum for you. Like yeah. uh, I, Scott Brick and I do this a lot. Oh, I'll go, nice. Scott, I just won an award. Here's the award. Magically on Facebook. Congratulations, Pops. He calls me Pops. <laughs> I call him Sonny. He's like 15 years younger than I am, but I don't push. You know, it's like, right. yeah, I would have been awfully busy when I was a Boy Scout <laughs> to have you. Wasn't happening, but I don't push it. You know. <laughs> right. But, you know, uh, we do that for each other. And it's a great thing if you're thinking about, if you're dying to tell somebody about a great job you got, you yeah. nailed an audition, think about it, then don't do it. Yeah. Get your promo buddy to do it for you. Uh, that's it's a it's a brilliant piece of, of just of of self management. You know, like it's it's right. Well, there's a Bible verse. Uh, it's a proverb. I think it's twenty seven three, but probably wrong. It says, "Let your praises be on another man's lips, hmm. a stranger's not your own." Well, Scott Brick isn't a stranger. He's strange though. He is strange. So that works. And you know what? I I could be wrong because you know, I know a lot of people that that really have house organs, look what I did, this is what I'm doing. And I'm just thinking, well, maybe it works in this lifetime. It, won't, it doesn't yeah. track afterwards, but that's... Yeah. And, and I think those trends come and go. And ultimately, I think that it was a, something I learned from Nancy Wolfson when I was working with her when I first got to town. And she was kind of helping me rebrand, um, which was immensely helpful. It was like going to her was like having... Friggin' voiceover therapy. She knows about branding. Boy. And she, oh, she knows a lot of stuff, but she's really astute at branding. She, uh, she, it was just, she just rained on me for an hour. And, uh, and she was like, oh, and you're, <laughs> you're, um, she said, you're, she's like, I listened to your reel and you are young, athletic, Midwestern guy with gusto. There. <laughs> and, and I was she, like, okay. she was my agent. Was she really? She was actually my agent for about a year or something like that. And I remember that she was pretty tough. Oh, man. She'd get an 8 by 10 and sometimes she'd put a red X over it and send it back. <laughs> That's pretty brutal. Oh, I didn't get the wrath. The oh, best. Nancy. Oh, but man. wow. I'm working hard to keep myself from getting the wrath. Oh, no. Yeah, you don't want to get yeah. that. 
Well, our, our time is rapidly coming to a close. I, I, one of the two things you're, you're, I hope your ears burn because we talk about you. We often the people sitting there and certainly myself, uh, talk about the influence and the impact that you've had on our careers. Well, and lives. you know, I'm grateful for you that. Know. You know, if somebody asked me on an interview, what's your legacy? I said, really, I don't think that way. I, I'm grateful that I've met my family's needs in a creative way mm. and I, I got gratitude for that and uh but i don't think legacy and it it's it's awfully nice to know that um to have a good reputation because mm. you know I, i'm i'm very good at a few things you know and it always reminds me of burt reynolds who met stay stacy no um spencer tracy when he was old uh. and hung out with him on the universal lot got to know him and he he said to Spencer Tracy's man, what don't you do well? And he went, living. Mm. I made a lot of mistakes, and you know, blood on the tracks, and sure. much much regret in my life. But so it's nice to hear somebody say, "Well, he taught me a great duck voice." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> well, more than that, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, I'll do all. I, I don't like doing all that. I like, but just know, <laughs> just know. That your your impact is widely felt, That's and great. and uh, and in an effort to share not only your uh, experiences but the um, your technique and your I mean I have I keep your slick tricks CD in my car. <laughs> and, you know I got into home course studies. I'm um, patfraley.com. Yeah, I must have fifteen five lesson home course studies where. Students send their homework in. I comment on it and go back and forth. So I'm kind of into that a lot because I, I just keep teaching things that I realize maybe I was gifted at, but some people need to learn the old-fashioned way. You know, yeah. that that's kind of really – I love to teach something no one else has taught yes. that I find out. Why didn't I teach this? Because, of course, they have to come to me. Yeah. They can't come to somebody else. But it's also like – Wow, like getting attention. No one teaches you how to get attention. Right. You, you can be have the skill set uh, that are huge, but if you because I've worked with these people with great skill sets, don't go anywhere. And also, mm. I work with people that are Johnny One Notes. Like I worked with Keanu Reeves when he was young, Johnny yeah. One Note. Yeah. But he got somewhere. Why? He got attention by the way he worked and his choices. Mm. And that's fundamental to know. How can I get their attention in the first four seconds of my audition? Because that's what they give you. Four, 10, 12 seconds. Yeah. And then you're out. They're never going to get to that great choice you made two and a half minutes into your Doesn't audition. Doesn't count. Yeah. In fact, Meredith Lane says, I give them four seconds. She's the casting queen yeah. at uh, Nickelodeon. If they don't get me, they're out. If they do, I listen to the rest of, say, a one-minute demo and listen for another surprise. So, yeah, yeah. Every so often you want to... Give them a whoa, but not all the time. Otherwise, it gets too Christopher walken -y. But sure. you got to get them up front. How do you slate? How can you do that first line different, like lighting a scene differently yeah. than all the other actors that are lined up that are better than you? And they're always a lot you, better. You always say play uh, chess with your career, not, not checkers. checkers. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a natural checkers player so it makes my brain hurt but i i have to work myself into a couple couple moves ahead of the other guy because good acting doesn't come from the head it comes from the heart yeah. but before you're a performer you got to be a professor even if it hurts hmm. pat thank you so much for joining me again if you want to always a pleasure if you want experience working with pat he comes around, he travels, he yeah. comes to your town. He, you come to people's towns, you go around, and then yeah. you also, your website is patfraley.com. Yeah, and that's my home course study so they can, Great. if they don't want to spend, you know, like eight hours in a room with me with Mr. Frady's milk breath on their, on their neck. But trust me, that milk breath, <laughs> it's worth, it's worth spending the time in there. All right. Thank you so much for coming in, Pat. This was great. Yeah. All right. Peace. Thank you for joining us on All Over VoiceOver with Kip VH. Please take a moment to review the show and let other folks know what you thought. And if you dug it, please subscribe. Follow the show on Twitter at All Over VO and check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash All Over VO with Kip VH.
That's it for this time. You get what you get, and don't get upset. Claim victory and depart the field.